Well, welcome once again to Outbreak, everyone. Um, before we get started, uh, just an announcement about a program, upcoming program that will be a week from this coming Thursday, uh, March 21st. And this is a talk by uh, Dr. Kamisha Higginbotham, who is the Dean of the Virginia Commonwealth uh, University School of Arts. And she will be talking about um, race and the realist impulse. And this is in relation to the uh, exhibition that's currently up now, American Art Between the Wars. And uh, we haven't had a chance to look at the exhibit. It's really a, kind of a, a wonderful exhibit that covers this period in uh, some really interesting ways and brings out many really important themes. And certainly one of them was the rise of uh, a number of African-American artists who began to have their own vision uh, of America at that time, and they're quite well represented in this show. So again, uh, this is going to be March 21st at 6 o'clock. Uh, it's $5 for KIA members and $10 for non-members, and you're encouraged to uh, register um, either at the desk or through kiaarts.org slash events. Well, today we'll be looking at graphic novels, which I'm sure most of you are familiar with by this point. Uh, they're really kind of an outgrowth of comic books, uh, only it allowed their creators to go in a more personal direction to address themes or issues or subjects they were particularly uh, con concerned with. And like the comics, for a long time, they just weren't taken seriously. Um, that all changed, however, when in uh, 1992, the, uh, the cartoonist and graphic novelist Art Spiegelman won the Pulitzer Prize for his graphic novel, Mouse. And what made that particular work um, sort of so unique and different and kind of groundbreaking was that uh, it was about his family's experiences during the Holocaust, and Spiegelman just impeccably researched all the background. So everything in this story was a true account. But it came to represent the story instead of people, he chose to use animals. And so the, the Jews were represented as mice and the Nazis as cats. And um, so suddenly it really opened up a whole new way of looking at this story that had been examined you know, in, in many forms previously. Um, and it um, allowed the pictures and the text to really work together to create something that was greater than the sum of the, some of the parts. And since then, this whole phenomenon of graphic novels has really blossomed. It's really a worldwide phenomenon, I should say. There's, uh, it's found throughout the country, throughout the world, and of course on all different subjects and themes. One important theme, though, is the idea of using a graphic novel as a form of activism or a way to uh, discuss um, or explore uh, aspects of activism. And um, comics have always been used for social commentary, but I think this is something different in that they are, the graphic novelists are actively engaging in issues of social justice and human rights through their work as opposed to just uh, commenting on them. And some of the most important uh, creators of this particular branch of graphic novels have been women. And that's what we're going to uh, be hearing about today. Uh, we're very pleased to have with us uh, Krista Turner. Krista is um, a PhD candidate at Western Michigan University, and her work focuses on social conflicts, war, civil resistance, and the way in which they appear in graphic novels. And so I think she's uniquely qualified to sort of address this really important aspect of the graphic novel the way it incorporates 
nonfiction, fiction, as well as fantasy to create this really highly original uh, genre. So please welcome Christopher Schumann. Thank you for that really thoughtful introduction. Um, I appreciate the brief history that you gave as well in comics. Um, I'm very honored to be here and share some of my work with you all. I thought I would begin by sharing a little bit about myself, my interest in comics, um, and the research that I do before moving on to the women and the collectives in comics who are doing some really great things. So like was mentioned, I am a PhD candidate at Western Michigan University in the English department. Um, I'm studying literature and I have multiple emphases. Uh, two of them are on late 19th century and early 20th century British and American literature. But my primary emphasis now is comic studies. Are there any of you that read comics at any point in your life or growing up? Yeah. Would you care to mention any of them? Archie. Archie. Brenda Starr. Brenda Starr. Garfield. Garfield. Yeah, so some of you are familiar with comics already. Um, my journey with comics really began in graduate school, which is quite late. <laughs> I read a graphic novel, Mar Jane Satrapi's Persepolis, as part of a global literature class during my master's. Um, Mar Jane Satrapi is one of those comics artists who is sort of in the same category as Art Spiegelman, who was mentioned. He really started the nonfiction movement with graphic novels, um, but Marjane Satrapi was influential in furthering that. Alison Bechdel, um, Joe Sacco, other comics artists like that. But I read Persepolis. Um, I very much enjoyed it, and we focused on it more for its historical and cultural context um, than the medium itself and the interplay of image and text. So fast forward to my doctoral studies, where I took an intro to comics course, and I learned more about the terminology, the mechanics, and the theory of comics, and something just clicked for me. And I found a medium that really suited my interests and abilities. Um, I have a background in art in addition to English, and was always looking for ways to bring those together, and comics was that. So even though I didn't really grow up reading them, I have a great affinity for them because of their potential to be both entertaining, but educational, inclusive, subversive, artful, exceptionally beautiful, um, and at times downright masterful. My personal taste in comics tends towards those that are classified as nonfiction or historical fiction. I enjoy comics. Um, Comics journalism, which is sometimes called reportage, autobiographies and biographies, and historical accounts that may or may not include fictionalized characters. I find these to be very impactful, and I often tell people that I've learned more about the world and its history and its geography and people by reading comics than in my history courses growing up. Comics have expanded my worldview, challenged my opinions, um, and my ideals. They've deepened my empathy, made social and cultural issues more understandable and personalized, and much, much more. I cannot recommend them enough. My research on comics is admittedly driven by my personal tastes. Broadly speaking, I focus on geopolitical conflict, war, and civil resistance and graphic narratives. And this often entails looking at specific social issues and movements as well. My work has appeared in the Children's Literature Association Quarterly, and I have a forthcoming article in the International Journal of Comics Arts, and I've presented both nationally and internationally on comics. But my current research is my dissertation, which is entitled Performativity and the Formal Elements of Comics, Reading Nonviolent Resistance in Graphic Novels. In my dissertation, I use performance as a lens to examine how comics creators are depicting scenes of nonviolent resistance, which are somewhat difficult to depict given that it is usually the more violent actions and events that draw a reader's eye on the page. Nonviolent resistance is a means of dramatizing a situation, as stated by Martin Luther King Jr. and other nonviolence practitioners. 
by collectively calling attention to a problem, thus forcing figures in authority to address grievances on a public stage. In this way, nonviolent resistance becomes a performance, revealing the similarities among comics, nonviolent resistance, and performance at operational, structural, and ideological levels, such as operating on a spectrum, parts coming together to form wholes, and challenging hierarchies, respectively. I draw on the elements of performance, such as performative acts, restored behavior, and ritual, and consider how comics creators communicate protest as performance, and what this performativity might look like based on certain cultural consideration, considerations and contexts. By thinking of these nonviolent resistance events as performance, we can see how the comics creators are using medium specific qualities such as colors, gutters, line styles, sounds, layered temporalities, etc., to foreground and make meaning of these events while also disrupting traditional narratives of protest, engaging with change, and having a real world impact through their art. The graphic novels that I examine are Sally Heathcote Suffragette by Mary M. Talbot, Kate Charlesworth, and Brian Talbot, The March Trilogy by John Lewis, Andrew Iden, and Nate Powell, Kent State, Four Dead in Ohio by Derek Bacter, and Tiananmen 1989, Our Shattered Hopes by the Mushan, Adrian Gambode, and MSN. All of these texts are part of the growing body of graphic novels that explore issues related to geopolitical conflict, social justice, human rights, and activism. One of the questions that I am asking in my dissertation dovetails nicely with the activism portion of this talk. That question is why comics? It's a question that many comic scholars ask, including Hilary Elshoot, who wrote a whole book examining several themes centered around this question. The more specific question in my case is why is comics a powerful medium for depicting and discussing nonviolent resistance and more broadly, activism? For a medium that A, has historically been dismissed as harmful and inferior to written texts, and B, is generally associated with superheroes, fiction, or fantasy, it seems that comics would not lend itself to such a serious topic grounded in real life. But it really does. And to see why, we need to examine its structure and how it functions. So we are going to delve into some of the theory behind comics here for a little bit. The definition of comics is widely discussed and debated among scholars, but I like how Barbara Postuma presents it in her book, Narrative Structure and Comics, Making Sense of Fragments. She writes, comics as an art form and as a narrative form is a system in which a number of disparate elements or fragments work together to create a complex whole. The elements of comics are partly pictorial, partly textual, and sometimes a hybrid of the two. These elements include the comics image or cartoons, the frames or panels that contain the images of which the page layout, including the book design is an important part, and the captions, word balloons, and the words themselves, whether they are inserted in balloons and captions or integrated into the image. As Postum mentions, there are all these individual formal elements that we traditionally think of as distinctly related to or representative of comics the image itself, the frame or the panels around the image, the words and how or where they are placed. But we also talk about lines and their style, panel shapes, sizes and arrangements, colors or the lack thereof, the way sound effects are represented and used, the way time and space are represented and more. All of these elements have meaning or signify something. For example, the shape of the panels. A very wide horizontal panel can indi indicate a long amount of time passing, and a tall vertical panel can indicate height, depth, a great change in elevation, or a long fall. Or in word balloons, a solid line balloon indicates speech, whereas a dotted line or a cloud-shaped balloon indicates internal thought. This is why Terry Grun Grinstein conceptualizes comics as a system, almost like a language, a collection of codes coming together to create meaning. 
Comics elements that mean something individually, quote, combine into sentences and into narratives and begin to signify in relation to each other to form a new meaning. One of the fundamental formal elements in comics that facilitates this process of signifying in relation to one another, which then creates meaning, is the gap in between the panels, which is called the gutter. Postman writes, in order to achieve this synthesis of the individual elements, the comics form relies on the force of absences, of the gap. The practice of surrounding images by frames or another kind of boundary to separate and define images begins to fill that gap by making it most apparent. It offers images specificity by anchoring them and relating them to one another by juxtaposing them. The framed panels and the page on which they are laid out create their own gaps, namely the spaces that now separate the panels, the gutters. As panels are juxtaposed on the page, they create sequences of images under the influence of the gutters, panels turn into isolated moments with time missing in between. In other words, the gaps are what produce the continuity of the sequence. As the two panels work to imply what happened in between, the gutters can stand in for actions and for narrative functions, such as scene changes or merely for the passage of time. But the overall effect is what makes comics a unique narrative form, one in which readers can observe the parts but perceive the whole. Um, that's Scott McCloud that describes it that way. He also refers to this as closure. The idea that even though uh, we see gaps, visually see gaps in between the images, we can infer what is happening in those spaces to fill in meaning and complete the sequences and ultimately the narrative. As Scott McCloud writes, comics panels fracture both time and space, offering a jagged staccato rhythm of unconnected moments. But closure allows us to connect these moments and mentally construct a continuous unified reality. In this way, the comics medium opens up a world of representative and narrative opportunities, while inviting readers to actively and intimately participate in meaning making in ways that other media do not. Gutters and the acts of closure that they entail are one of the aspects that make the comics medium an ideal form for discussing heavy topics such as trauma, war, violence, social injustice, and human rights violations. The implication of what happens in the gutters allows for the expression of violence, the unutterable, or the forgotten that may be pertinent to the narrative without overtly depicting it if the author does not want to or can't which also happens to mimic the way that memory and recollection work, as cartoonist Chris Ware has suggested. Fragmented pieces or moments that may be blurry or have gaps as they come together. Examples of this technique of leaving violence or traumatic memory in the gutter can be found in Art Spiegelman's Mouse, Linda Berry's 100 Demons, and Joe Sacco's commissioned piece, The War Crimes Trials. Gutters allow for the strategic omission of violent or disturbing images if that is what creators choose, but if they don't, creators can also capitalize on the medium's very visual nature to confront difficult topics and memories. Shoot has written in her comic scholarship that the medium is apt for bearing witness to and documenting traumatic and violent events due to its combination of image and text, which is quite self-reflexive and repetitive as it visualizes interpretation and pushes back against invisibility and silence. Additionally, in the succession of replete frames, comics calls attention to itself, specifically as evidence. Comics makes a reader access the unfolding of evidence in the moment of its basic grammar by aggregating and accumulating frames of information. Comics, she writes, suggest we look and then look again. Between the two different aspects I've highlighted, along with many more, the medium of comics, writes Martin Lund, has a nearly limitless communicative potential. And this is what makes it an attractive art form for discussing the personal and public, the mundane and controversial, and especially, as others and I have argued, for discussing and depicting politics, activism, and social issues. 
Renowned scholar and cultural critic Edward Said notes that comics can say what cannot otherwise be said, or perhaps what is not permitted to be said or imagined, defying the ordinary processes of thought, which are policed, shaped, and reshaped by all sorts of pedagogical as well as ideological pressures. Said recognizes that by saying what cannot be said outright, comics has the ability to subvert any previous and perhaps unrecognized indoctrination in order to challenge and or re-educate the reader. The combination of image and text confronting the reader opens up the gates of inquiry and thought into matters previously inaccessible, whether intentionally or subconsciously. This means of access through text and image is an element largely at play in comics that deal with uglier events, both personal and global. One can both read and visualize traumatic events, thereby acknowledging and confronting them in order to process the unutterable and the unthinkable, but also to reconceptualize or reframe it. I also should add here that one of the things that makes comics a good form for processing the traumatic and violent events is the pacing. Unlike film, where um, viewers are forced to view the images at a certain speed, Comics allows you the leisure to look as long as you want or flip through as quickly as you want. The ability to reconceptualize, reframe, or outright reform spoken or unspoken cultural ideologies and norms that have informed people's social opinions and actions is a key aspect of the comics medium that I want to point out, and one that is fundamental to using comics to document or take part in activism. As I turn more directly to the activism portion of this talk, I want to begin by considering some definitions. In his article, Comics Activism, A Partial Introduction, Martin Lund takes a look at the history of comics activism, discusses the terms, and gives examples of types of comics activism. He defines comics activism as the practice of creating comics in support of or opposition to one side of a controversial issue whereas he defines activist comics as comics that are created specifically and explicitly to present the creator's given politics on a specific issue. He does make note that the term activism and activist are labels that can be controversial and have various connotations. However, while they are limiting and or nebulous in social contexts at times, he does find them helpful for theorizing and distinguishing people actively working for social change from those that do not. He writes, comics activism and activist comics delineate and identify those within the largely depoliticized field of comics who are working towards its politicization as creators as, and as critics, as makers and as readers and the comics they produce and read. Besides these definitions, Lund includes a brief history on comics activism in the United States that is very apropos for today's talk because comics activism really began to take cohesive shape because of women. Lund writes that the graphic arts are no stranger to voicing political support or opposition, whether to the reigning orthodoxy or to progressive or radical critique of that orthodoxy, and that early iterations of activist comics took the form of woodcuts and broadsheets as soon as mass printing became available through the invention of the printing press. He shares the story of Thomas Nast taking down a, cor a corrupt politician, Boss Tweed, in the 1870s by exposing his misdeeds and turning public opinion against him through a series of political cartoons. Apparently, the fugitive Tweed was even identified by Spanish authorities because of Nast's depiction of him. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, the development of comic strips happened uh, that often appeared in newspapers and periodicals, at times adopting political topics alongside the political cartoons. And then in the 1930s, comic books arrived on the scene. Lund writes that while activism was not unheard of in these early comic books, it was not overly common. The form would rather focus on propaganda during the World War II years. It wasn't until the decades after the war that a loose form of comics activism began to be associated with the countercultural underground comic scene, which was called comics with an X on the end, that formed in reaction to lingering McCarthyism and conservative pushback against hippie and youth culture in the 1960s. 
that resulted in the government trying to regulate comment book content and publication. Lund explains that many of these undergrounds were oppositional, but more to cultural mores than to political circumstances. They were long on sex, drugs, and profanity, but in general, short on politics, with important exceptions, particularly when it comes to anti-war undergrounds. As a phenomenon, the undergrounds were by no means apolitical, but their politics were, in many cases, unfocused. According to Lund, the focus came amidst the feminist movement from women comics artists who sought to make a name for themselves in the male-dominated industry. In the underground scene, according to cartoonist Trina Robbins, 98% of the cartoonists were men, and they all seemed to belong to a boys club that didn't accept women. So Robbins and Barbara Willie Mendez co-edited the first known all-female comic book, the 1970 underground anthology, It Ain't Me, Babe, comics. The cover, which featured a group of well-known female comics characters marching, called for women's liberation. Its contents were similarly radical. Lunds continues that this anthology was quickly followed by a number of comics by women, such as the anthology Women's Comics, which was from 1970, 1972 to 1992. Um, it was designed by Robbins and her co-creators to provide a platform for new comics creators. While Joyce Farmer and Lynn Shevley's Tits and Clits comics, which ran from 1972 to 1987, was meant to bring a sense of humor to the women's movement. The feminist comics movement heralded a doubly activist turn, according to Lund. First, it marked the first time women were truly able to produce comic stories on their own a prerogative that had to be actively taken. And second, it is probably the first time in American comics history that any organized sense of group movement and belonging fueled comics creation in a sustained way. Having started as a response to the misogyny and sexism of the underground and provided a forum for women to speak explicitly and politically about issues that affect women, Feminist comics have kept inspiring women to make comics and to speak out even as society and the comics industry have remained mired in the same problems. Feminist themes run amongst many of the activist comics that women are producing today, but women are also embracing intersecting themes of identity, sexuality, motherhood, women's rights, climate change, refugee crises, immigration, prison reform, representation, and more in their work. So now I want to turn towards these women and the women's collectives that are producing these comics. There's a lot of comics activism happening around the world by both individual women and the collectives that they are part of or bringing together themselves. Many of these comics artists refer to themselves as activists, but there are many other women who are actively engaging with activist content in their work, even if they don't label themselves as such. The first cartoonist that I want to highlight is Mary M. Talbot, one of whose works I research as part of my dissertation. Talbot is a gender politics scholar by training, but turned to the comics medium after retiring with encouragement from her husband, Brian Talbot, who was also a well-known comics artist himself. Her first graphic novel was an autobiography about her life as the daughter of James S. Atherton, a scholar dedicated to the work of literary great James Joyce. It is called Daughter of Her Father's Eyes and intertwines the story of Joyce's daughter, Lucia, with Talbot's own story growing up in the shadow of her literary father. Talbot discusses issues of gender, language, power, and feminism in her work and is an activist of sorts for the comics medium itself, which she effuses is just wonderful. Journalist Laura Snedden describes Talbot as a woman with a mission to revolutionize comics in the UK. And Talbot attempts to do this not only through her own comics work, but through the Lakes International Comic Art Festival, which she organized in 2013 and which is still occurring. The next one is in September of this year, if you feel like going. Talbot has highlighted women, particularly revolutionaries, activists, and feminists thus far in her work with her other notable biographic graphic novels, talking about the British suffragettes and Sally Heathcote suffragette, women's rights advocate and surrealist painter Leonora Carrington in Armed with Madness, the surreal Leonora Carrington, 
French feminist and social revolutionary Louise Michel in The Red Virgin and the Vision of Utopia. And she has also delved into climate change in the fictional reign and its consequences like internally displaced persons as part of the collaborative futuristic thriller graphic novel, IDP 2043. On this next slide, you can see some excerpts from three of her works, The Red Virgin, Rain, and Sally Heathcote. Sally Heathcote really has a lot of um, very poignant depictions of resistance throughout its pages. Another artist to pay attention to is Kate Evans. Evans is a British cartoonist, artist, activist, author, and mother whose work, writes Dominic Davies, operates at the intersection of several of the most exciting genre developments in comics in recent years. Her most recent work is fiction, but most of her work is largely under the nonfiction umbrella, where she engages with graphic memoir, biography, graphic reportage, and educational comics, both in book length projects and in shorter forms on her blog. She writes about social revolutionaries, refugee crises in Europe, climate change, and motherhood. Some of her notable graphic novels on these topics include Threads from the Refugee Crisis, uh, as the first one. This graphic novel details the time that Evans spent in the Kalai refugee camp known as the Jungle reporting on the lives of the refugees there and the physical conditions and prejudice that they endure. Threads addresses one of the most pressing issues in modern times to make a compelling case through intimate evidence for the compassionate treatment of refugees and the free movement of peoples, according to Verso Books Review. Another one of her graphic novels is Red Rosa, a graphic biography of Rosa Luxemburg. A giant of the political left, Rosa Luxemburg is one of the foremost minds in the canon of revolutionary socialist thought. But she was much more than just a thinker. She made herself heard in a world inimical to the voices of strong-willed women. She overcame physical infirmity and the prejudice she faced as a Jew to become an active revolutionary whose philosophy enriched every corner of an incredibly productive and creative life always opposed to the First World War when others on the German left were swept up on a tide of nationalism. She was imprisoned and murdered in 1919, fighting for a revolution she knew to be doomed. Evans has also written about climate change in Funny Weather, everything you didn't want to know about climate change, but probably should find out. And the UK anti-road and open cast protests of the 1990s in Cops, the cartoon book of tree protesting. Evans has stated that she likes working in the comics medium because of its immediacy and accessibility, its cost-effective nature to create as opposed to something like a film project, the emotional connection it builds with readers, and how it is well-suited for telling traumatic stories while maintaining anonymity if needed, but also including moments of humor to lighten the mood. When asked if she sees herself as a comics journalist or an artist, she replies, I probably see myself more as an activist than as a journalist or an artist. Although I am happy to work with newspapers and magazines, I have an uneasy relationship with the journalistic profession, born from a distaste acquired when I was a Rhodes protester and the subject rather than the author of journalistic inquiry. Graphic journalism implies that the writer makes a stab at objectivity. I don't believe that objectivity exists. I like my comics to do something. I have an ax to grind. I will use every tool in my toolkit to engage the reader with the story, to take them on an emotional journey, and so I will enhance the drama of the situation as much as I possibly can, insofar as it is consistent with the facts. The city of Kalai is known for its lace making. So here in this excerpt, you can see the visual motif of lace that runs throughout the graphic novel. And there's an excerpt from Funny Weather as well. Another influential activist and comics artist is Nathanoi Tristram. Tristram has drawn comics her entire life and manages to do so even though she has a full-time job at a digital democracy NGO. She says that her comics and her job inspire one another. Her work covers topics such as politics, 
activism, social memoir, reportage, and fashion. She writes, I am interested in the power of comics to educate, enrage, and create change in the world, as well as the small inequities of everyday life. I tackle global systemic issues, always with some humor and with the aim of also putting visually appealing artwork into the world. Tristram is the driving force behind Draw the Line, which is a project from 2016 to 2017 that brought together more than 100 comic artists from around the world, each depicting action you could take when you don't like the current political landscape. She described it as a toolkit meant to encourage tangible effects on the real world, and it was self-published as a volume and later as an adapted version for the U.S. in 2021. You can read more about it and purchase the book at drawthelinecomics.com. She is also part of the Comics Cultural Impact Collective, which they pronounce CSIC, which is an independent group of professionals within the UK comics community, working together with the aim of raising awareness of the cultural impact of comics and to help make the case for better funding, support, and recognition. In 2022, Tristram published Sorry for the Inconvenience, We Are Trying to Save the World. In it, she recreates moments of protest from both contemporary and more historical times in a series of visual vignettes that aim to spotlight a wealth of great placard slogans to dip into when you're planning to save the world. It mixes sequential elements with single illustrations, the latter still employing some of the tools of comics like speech bubbles. It also includes sections on why the current UK government is so hell-bent on suppressing freedom of speech, how to construct a banner, the role of protest in a functioning democracy, and tips for staying safe when protesting. This is according to um, one of the reviewers. And as this reviewer and others have noted, the graphic novel stands out for its practical sections, which are not only instructional, but also positive in their message that our vanishing rights to express ourselves in the UK don't have to remain the status quo, and also suggesting ways to demonstrate um, that circumvent the current undemocratic policies of the Conservative Party. At a time when we are experiencing the dictates of an increasingly totalitarian and despotic government, sorry for the inconvenience, we are trying to save the world as a small beacon of shining hope in these darkest of times. In 2023, she started creating the Noisy Valley, which she calls a scribbly little zine. In it, she talks about true stories of protests from the Rhonda Valley in South Wales. And the ongoing project is a response to current day politics and the erosions of rights to protest. As of December, 2023, she has, come, she has completed the introduction plus nine people's tales of protest and has one final interview and an epilogue to create. In the US, a comics artist who engages with activism through her work is Leila Abdel Razak. Abdel Razak is a Palestinian American author and artist based in Detroit, whose works include graphic novels, zines, comics, digital animation, posters, and other writings. She says that her creative work primarily explores issues related to diaspora, refugeehood, history, memory, and borders and her research as a scholar is focused on Palestinian futurist art and post-national imaginaries. As an abolitionist and an artist, Layla is invested in imagining what Palestinian liberation might look like beyond the violence inherent in statehood. Her debut graphic novel is entitled Badawi and tells the story of a young boy named Aham, Ahmad struggling to find his place in the world. Raised in a refugee camp called Badawi in northern Lebanon, Ahmad is just one of the many thousands of refugee children born to Palestinians who fled their homeland after the war in 1948, established the state of Israel. In this visually arresting graphic novel, Abdel Razak explores her father's childhood in the 1960s and 70s from a boy's eye view as he witnesses the world crumbling around him and attempts to carry on forging his own path in the midst of terrible uncertainty. She was a guest editor and illustrator for Misna, the comics issue, in which she chose the theme, The New World Order, which asked artists to explore what it means for reality, whether the personal micro-realities that we inhibit or the larger political realities that engulf us, to undergo radical transformative shifts for better or for worse. 
Her other works include The Opening, which explores the loss of a child and making sense of absences of all kinds. The Fig Tree, a short comic on purpose, pleasure, and ancient traditions of Palestinian women. And Border Diary, The Sardine Tin, Single Issue Voter, Refugees Against Borders, and others that detail occupation, resistance, foreign political policies, and the history and culture of Palestine. Abdel Ruzak's work is not limited to comics creation. She has gotten into publishing as well. In 2016, she started Big Mouth Press and Comics, which began as a blog profiling different Middle Eastern women authors and artists working in comics and illustration, but then expanded into distribution of those same artists she had been highlighting. As the business began to grow, she partnered with Aya Kreisht, a printmaking artist from Dearborn, Michigan, and Zainab Saab, another printmaker originally from Dearborn. They launched a multidisciplinary collective that would publish the comics of Middle Eastern women, artists, and build a community around them. This collective was rebranded as Mamul Press and offers a space to discuss issues affecting the community without having to explain our position to others, Abdel Razak says. According to Krisht, Mamul Press offers a space to just tell our own stories about being human and about our lives without it always being this huge identity statement or ethnocultural lesson. Mamul Press also puts on workshops for young women from Middle Eastern and North African backgrounds, offering them a cost-free opportunity to learn the full process of making a comic book from conception to creation Another goal of Mamul Press is to draw attention to all this cool stuff being produced all over the world and getting it out there for people all over the world to enjoy. I want to take this opportunity to also highlight a webtoon artist. Webtoons are very popular and are often the inspiration for TV series or films, but they are admittedly outside of my particular wheelhouse. Um, I came upon the webtoon artist Sleepy Mia who draws in an anime style in an article entitled Six Female Webtoon Artists Around the World Shaping Digital Comic Space by Francesca Miller. This is what Miller has to say about her. American-born Mia is the creator of two ongoing web comics, The Edge of Normal and There Are Not Enough Black Girls in the Anime. The latter was removed from some platforms due to online abuse, but the name spoke for itself, as like most of Mia's work, it champions black female representation. In The Edge of Normal, the two main characters, Juniper and Jasper, meet as they try to navigate living with their respective mental health issues. Mia's webtoon bravely explores the subject of anxiety and mental fragility, subjects that are traditionally taboo in most Black communities. Mia is very active on Instagram, and in addition to championing Black representation, she gives practical tips as well, demonstrating digital tools and techniques for things like choosing melanated skin tones effectively and how to draw curly hair. This is an example of her work on Instagram. Asia El Fassi is a British Libyan illustrator and graphic novelist who has won awards for her work. She was born and spent time in Libya before moving to Scotland. El Fassi recounts that as a child, she was bullied in school because of cultural differences. But once her schoolmates discovered she could draw a manga, she became quite popular and earned their respect. Because of this, she realized comics' immense potential for humanizing issues and bringing the plight of often marginalized peoples to the fore, and therefore furthering understanding. Ever since, she has represented the Muslim and Arab voice through her work with the ultimate aim of harnessing the medium as a tool for cross-cultural dialogue. Her work has been included in the Mammoth Book of Best New Manga and featured on the walls in Piccadilly Circus Tube Station. She returned to Libya in early 2011 and stayed during the uprising against Gaddafi, which inspired her to write about Libya and the stories of people living under the Gaddafi regime. El Fossi is also part of Positive Negatives, which is a visual research organization that creates compelling animations, comics, and podcasts about pressing social, humanitarian, and environmental issues with the aim to bring academic research to a larger mainstream audience so it can have a bigger impact, according to their website. 
They combine ethnographic research with creative techniques to transform personal stories into art, education, and advocacy materials. El Fossi has created work for positive negatives, such as Amnesty International, I Welcome, which you can see an example of here, um, which creates awareness about the plight of women in refugee camps. Another one is Into Our Own Hands, which is a story about a displaced person. Nadia's Story, which is about a refugee mother, and Ola, which is about child migrants waiting for citizenship. She also puts on comics workshops for young people interested in comics. And El Fossi has stated in recent years that she has multiple projects forthcoming. She's gotten a bit silent on those and we'll get to see them, but you should definitely keep an eye out for her work and check out her other projects in the meantime. Before I close my presentation, I want to briefly spotlight three other artists who are putting out work with activism themes, even if they aren't necessarily considered comics activists. The first is Dina Mohammed, a Cairo-based cartoonist, writer, and designer. She created the webcomic Kahara, which is about a visibly Muslim Egyptian superhero that addresses social issues such as Islamophobia and misogyny. The second is Chelsea Saunders, a New York-based freelance illustrator who also makes comics. She draws a lot of short comics that address, so address socio-political and racial issues as well as protest. You can find her work on The Nib, which as a side note, The Nib is a publisher of web content and a print magazine dedicated specifically to political cartoons and nonfiction comics about what is going down in the world. So it is a great place to find even more comics creators that are into comics activism. The third comics artist and illustrator is Kiku Hughes, who is based in Seattle. She makes comics on identity, queer romance, and compassionate sci-fi. Her debut graphic novel, Displacement, is semi-autobiographical and tells the story of the protagonist, Kiku, who time travels to the 1940s and is incarcerated in the same internment camp for Japanese Americans during World War II that her grandmother was in as a young woman. The graphic novel tells about how the people in the camps built community and engaged in resistance. Hughes also illustrated the graphic novel, Those Who Helped Us, written by Ken Mochizuki, which is also about the incarceration of Japanese Americans during World War II. There are many more women that I could mention, and I do encourage you to look into the work of creators such as Kim Hyun Suk, Nicola Streeton, Jackie Fleming, Maya Kobabe, the international collective called Chicks on Comics, which did unfortunately end in 2022, but you can still find their work. Lila Corman, Kelly Sue DeConnick, and Joyce Brabner. All of these women are engaging with pressing socio-political and cultural issues, facilitating important conversations, challenging ideas and perceptions, and working to create change in the world through their art. Thank you. I believe at this time, we're opening it up for questions, if anybody has any. Oh, Kent State, I think that was published in 2020. It's a fairly recent one. Uh, once you finish your PhD, are you planning to secure a uh, university position where you will focus on topics? Or? Um, okay, so the question was, once I finish my PhD, if I plan on securing a position where I can focus on comics. Um, not immediately. Uh, I think I'm going to go the writing and editing route for a while. I might come back to teaching. Um, I have taught courses on comics and nonviolence and resistance. Um, so it's definitely still an interest. I plan to publish on it after I graduate still. I have a writing partner. Um, who actually introduced me to nonviolent resistance studies. Uh, we have a series of articles lined up. So it's something that I'll still engage with for sure, but don't have any teaching plans with at the moment.
So if you have more questions, you can feel free to find me afterwards. Otherwise, I think we will wrap this up. Thank you so much for your time.